good to be in God's presence. You may be seated as we watch a video for missions. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 13 through 16, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. Jesus tells you and me in this passage who we are and how we are to live within our community. Take, Take what, what Jesus, Jesus says, says to, heart. to heart. Notice, Notice the, the impact, impact he desires, desires for your life. life. See, See your purpose, purpose proclaim this, this passage. passage. Salt, salt flavors and, and preserves. Salt, salt must, must be offered in, in order, order to be tasted. tasted. Salt, salt must, must come in contact, contact with what, what is intended, intended to preserve. Likewise, Likewise we, must we must offer ourselves to others, others in our community. community. We, we must, must come, come in contact, contact with our neighbors. As, as salt, salt, we are called to make a difference in the culture and in the lives of our neighbors. Light illuminates by chasing out the darkness. Light must be uncovered. Barriers, barriers that create, create darkness, darkness must, must be removed, removed as, as we move into, into the presence of others, others in our community. community. The, the light, light of Christ, Christ shines through, through us and chases, chases out the darkness. darkness. Jesus, Jesus says in Matthew, Matthew 5, 5, 16, In the, in the same, same way, way let, let your light, light shine, shine before, before people, people so, so they, they can, can see the good things, things you do and, and praise, praise your Father, Father who is in heaven. heaven. This, this is our purpose, to belong and to engage in our community, to add flavor and to preserve what is good in our culture. To shine, shine the, light the light of Christ, of Christ in a dark, dark world. world. To, to do good and, and, and connect, connect others, others with our Father, Father who is in heaven. heaven. On, On October 6, 1895, the first, first church, church service, service was held in Los Angeles with the name Nazarene, Nazarene in the service, service announcement. Phineas Brzee proclaimed that Nazarenes were to focus on city mission, mission evangelism, evangelism, and, and Christian, Christian holiness. holiness. Our, our regional vision today is represented in the cycle of resurgence. Our vision is mobilizing all Nazarene community, blessing our community, bringing people to Jesus, and becoming Christ-like disciples. God is on the move in the USA and Canada, Church of the Nazarene. 2024 is the year we will focus on blessing our community. We can no longer wait inside the walls of the church for people that are seeking God. We must go out where the people are. We must be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We must, we must strive, strive to be a blessing, blessing to our neighbors, befriend them, them and build authentic, authentic relationships, and, and share, share our stories and the gospel as, as God, God provides the opportunities. Paul, Paul writes in Galatians 6.9, 6, let's, let's not, not get, get tired of doing good, good because in time we'll, we'll have a harvest, harvest if, if we don't, don't give up. up. Imagine 5,000 churches with 500,000 Nazarenes blessing 5 million people. This is possible as we come together. Mobilizing all Nazarenes in unity. You were invited to join the movement with our USA and Canada region. Our half million mobilization theme this year is blessing our community. I hope this time in prayer will do a deep work in our lives and our churches to be a mighty force for blessing our communities throughout the year ahead. The prayer time that led up to that first Christian Pentecost started as a sit-in. In fact, Jesus commanded his disciples to wait until they were clothed with power in Luke 24:49. But when the day of Pentecost came, God's manifest, miraculous power presence resulted in those early believers exploding from sitting in to being sent out. As we encounter his divine power through these 50 days of prayer, 
May the Lord mobilize all Nazarenes in unity, empowering us to bless our communities, bring people to Jesus, and become Christ-like disciples. That's from Stan Reeder, Director of USA Canada Region, Church of the Nazarene. If you remember the last two years, we had this half million mobilization. I believe many of you know how powerful prayer is. Imagine how powerful when you have a half million mobilized praying for the same thing. So up here on the altar and at each welcome desk, I have prayer journals. If you see up on the slide, if you prefer on your phone or computer or something, you can download the app and you'll get notifications daily of the day's prayer. But this year, they're asking us to go out into our communities to serve the people, to be the light of Jesus. So will you please join in for the half million mobilization this year? It starts on Easter Sunday and goes through Pentecost. As a reminder, on Easter Sunday will be our Easter offering for the World Evangelism Fund. Just mark it separate before you put it in the plate so the counters know and the treasurer can get it sent to the World Evangelism Fund. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are blessed to know you and be in presence with you, but there are many in this world who are not. May we be your hands and feet. May we go out and shine your light for those who do not know you yet. Lord, we pray for our missionaries all the time, and we talk about how they travel around the world. And some of us think, I can never do that. But we got to realize, Lord, the world is right here in our community, too. We just need to reach out. Reach out with a loving touch, with a guiding hand, with any way that we find we can help in our community. Lord, be with us and guide us as we go through this 50 days of prayer. And may we go ahead in the year ahead to reach out and shine your light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Becky. 500, or 500,000, right? Half a million up, standing up in prayer. There's going to be power in that. Amen. Why don't you stand as we continue to praise and sing to Jesus this morning. Crown him with many crowns. Crown him with many crowns. The Lamb of God is joy. Our God the I see 
chapter 12, and I'm going to read just two verses, 12 and 13. The next day, the great crowd had come for the feast and heard that Jesus was on his way into Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Does anybody know what Hosanna means? Can anybody tell me what Hosanna means? Anybody? Say it loud, I'm deaf. Save. Hosanna means save. That's a perfect word for Jesus, is it not? <laughs> it's exactly what he came to do. He came to save. Not in the way they were thinking when he was ushering in on Palm Sunday. They were thinking he came to save them from their oppressors. He came for much more than that. He came to save us. Completely, completely save us. He came to save us from sin. He came to save us from death and separation from Jesus. Church, Jesus still saves today. He still saves us from sin's grasp and the hold that Satan tries, tries to have on us. 
but he can't do it because at the name of Jesus, Satan must flee. There is power in the name of Jesus. Let's call on the name of Jesus this morning in our own lives, in our families' lives, in the church, in our church's lives. Let's call on the name of Jesus and let's speak his name, Jesus.
Well, we want to take this time and, and have some prayer and prayer want around the altars. Maybe you have a specific need this morning. Um, come up here. Uh, we're also, if, if you need to be anointed, come on down and just let me know. We're going to ask Brandy to come down, and we're going to anoint her on behalf of Doug. And if you, we've been praying for Doug Clark for a while. Um, just really dealing with a lot of different things. Uh, but this past week, he passed out, hit his head, went to the hospital, found out he broke his hip on the fall on top of all the other things. And then yesterday, um, they discovered that he has a pinching of the nerve around the C2, C3 that could cause permanent damage and as of today, he can't even feed himself. So he was taken to Traverse City. So we just need to lift him up and lift Dawn up. So, Brandy, if you wouldn't mind. Um, we also want to pray for Dave. Dave, if you wouldn't mind coming down. Dave is getting ready to go on a mission trip to Kentucky. And we just want to pray that God would protect him and use him during this time. So if you wouldn't mind kneeling at the altar, Dave. You know, the Lord knows what you're going through. Sometimes I wonder if we feel like our need isn't bad enough, and so we don't want to bother the Lord with it. And yet He invites us. He wants to be part of that, to wrap His arms around us, to walk with us, just to hear from us. Lord, this morning, we thank you for Dave's heart. We thank you for his willingness to, to serve and worshiping you uh, each Sunday. And Lord, he felt a sense and an opportunity opened up. And, he's, and he doesn't have all the answers, but he said, Lord, here am I. Okay, I will go. And I'm just praying that you would go before him, protect him. But Lord, use him. Let people see Jesus and his countenance. May you use him to touch people, uh, to share his faith with individuals, and give him the strength that he is going to need as he travels and puts in some hard work and loving people that he doesn't even know. And Lord, this morning we are lifting up Doug to you, and so we are going to anoint Brandy in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, on Doug's behalf, praying for a miracle. Lord, we don't know what is going on, all the things that he's had to face, but we know this. We know you are the great physician, and we know that you can perform miracles even today. And so we trust you. We trust you with our families. We trust you with those that we love and care about. We trust you with individuals we don't even know yet. And Lord, we thank you for Kevin. And he is about to go on a journey that he doesn't know what the outcome is, but you do. You do. And you have provided a way, all the prayers, and we thank you that he received a green light that this liver transplant will go through in April. But, Lord, we need you to still guide the surgeons. We need you to touch his body. And so, Lord, I am going to anoint him this morning. So in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, will you fill Kevin in a special way with your Holy Spirit? Would you help his body to heal, to be able to go through with the surgery and come out the other side praising his Lord and Savior. There are so many things that you're doing that we don't even understand, but you are doing a work. And Lord, this morning, whether we recognize it or not, whether it's the way we want you to or not, we are praising you. So we lift these up to you and ultimately put them in your hands. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.
Amen and amen. Kids are dismissed this morning to Kids Grove. And as they're going, just a couple things. Um, we, obviously, next week is Easter. So this, the services for this week looks like this. Friday, 7 p.m. at the Methodist Church is Good Friday service, 7 p.m. That's like a all church thing. Sunday morning here, sunrise will be at 8.30, followed by a breakfast, and then our regular service will be at 10.30. At what time? All right, because some of you will roll in at 11. Um, this is what we need, though. We will have over 100 people for this breakfast. We just need everybody to sign up for something, and it can be something little. So we have a sign-up sheet on that Welcome Center, a sign-up sheet on that Welcome Center. So please make sure you go there, you find a spot, put your name down, and um, that would be good. Draw your swords and turn to Matthew 21. And for those that are a little worried, yes, we're going to continue our seven seals of Revelation. Um, in a little while, okay? But there's some things that we need to go through first as we enter Holy Week. Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. What would you do, or how would you respond, if you have been waiting something your entire life, and then it finally happened? You see this all the time on these home makeover shows, shows or someone buying a home for the very first time. In fact, Carrie was watching one last night. And the first question I have is, what in the world do these people do that their first home they can afford a half a million dollar home? Right? That's my question. Um, but when you see them for their very first home, you see this, I don't even know, it's beyond exuberance. It's this excitement of finally having something that belongs to them, something where they can call it home. And, and it's not unusual that you see one or both of them breaking down and just crying, almost like they never thought it would happen. For the Jewish nation, they are in Israel, they're in their homeland, but in many ways they're held like captives. They're not really free because they're controlled by the Roman Empire. And yet every year, they hold on hope because they've been told generation after generation after generation that one day there will be one who will come and will free them. Today we're going to look at the messianic hope. So look with me at Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went, and they did just as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey, the colt, placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth and Galilee. When we look at the New Testament authors, almost all of them are Jewish and yet they write in a way that is very general for all people. 
but there's something very unique to Matthew. We know Matthew was one of the 12 disciples. We also know that he was a tax collector. So, he was Jewish by birth and also hated by his own countrymen, at least while he was a tax collector. And we also know that probably more than likely, even the disciples had a hard time with him at first. And we're learning that on Wednesday night. If you have not been there, you need to come as we're going through the chosen that really brings personhood to the disciples. So, something that's different about Matthew is this. Matthew often draws from the Old Testament. He often points toward customs and Jewish traditions. Now, when you read Matthew, he's not limiting who it's for. It's still for everybody. But I think this is what Matthew is doing. I think Matthew is writing in a specific way to the Jewish people to point out that Jesus is, in fact, the coming Messiah they've been waiting for. Now, here's what's going on. The disciples and Jesus are on their way to Jerusalem. And they are an emotional roller coaster. Have you ever had a day where you just felt like it was an emotional roller coaster with highs and lows? I was thinking about this because I'm not a, like a real emotional person. But I actually had one of those days. And yes, Caleb was involved. <laughs> so, we were just newly married. Well, I shouldn't be newly married, probably a few years. I'm not sure how old Caleb was. He might have been like five months old or something. Here it is. It's my birthday. It's a great day. My emotions are high. But on the way home, I get into a car accident. It's a bad day. In fact, the lady in front of me slammed on her brakes, but I'm a good driver, so I made sure there was enough space, so I slammed on my brakes, and I had room. But apparently the person behind me did not give me the same amount of space and rear-ended me. But at that time, I worked at an insurance company. So it ended up turning out to be a good day because there was minimal damage. In fact, you could hardly tell, but I knew about the mini-tort law, so I actually got money from the accident. I got home. Caleb did not have his nap. <laughs> it was a bad day. <laughs> but Carrie was taking me to my, one of my favorite restaurants, a Middle Eastern restaurant, so it was go a good day. Only to realize we each would have to eat in turn while the other sat in the bathroom with a crying baby. It was a bad day. That is the emotional roller coaster the disciples are on. They are daydreaming about this event. They are going up to Jerusalem. It is something that they looked forward to. It brought back memories of traveling with their parents, uh, seeing the beauty of the temple, the amenities of a big city, all the excitement all the anticipation and they couldn't help but smile as they're making their way to the big city but on the way they have to pass through a town and as they're traveling in this daydream in the anticipation and in this excitement all of a sudden Jesus gives them word and it changes the atmosphere and this is Matthew chapter 20 Verses 17 through 19. Do we have that? If we don't have it, I, okay, I can read it. Here we go. Matthew 20, verses 17 through 19. Now, as Jesus was going to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples to the side. We are going to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked 
and to be flogged and crucified, and on the third day he will raise to life. You know, have you ever just felt like there was a day that you're just excited and you've got all this, and, and you might even be in the middle of a daydream when someone just comes and brings you bad news? That's what's going on here. They are on their way, remembering all the memories, all the times they've gone to the temple before. This is, this is the height of Jesus' ministry, the anticipation. They feel like they, they know what this might mean. And then all of a sudden, Jesus takes them aside and he says this, Boys, this isn't going to be pretty. When we get there, the religious leaders are going to take me because one of you will betray me. They will find me guilty. They will hand me over to the Romans, and then the Romans will beat me. They will mock me, they will flog me, and they will crucify me. And they had to take that in. And then they crest a hill. And they come into a small town. And that's when things begin to get real interesting. Let's look at verses 1 through 3 of our main passage there in 21. Verses 1 through 3. As they approached Jerusalem and they came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her untie them and bring them to me if anyone says anything to you say to the lord or say that the lord needs them and he will send them right away now we're going to put up a map of bethphage in israel okay just so you can kind of get your bearings if you're not familiar with this. So Jesus and the disciples have left from Bethany and they're making their way to the temple. Now when they crest this hill, this right here on the Mount of Olives, Bethphage, I believe that sits like 200 feet higher than the temple, which is up on the mount as well. So they're looking down at the temple and that's about a mile between the two. As they enter the city, Jesus says something that seems a little odd. He says, I need two of you guys to go and get a donkey and a colt. Now, Jesus doesn't do this without some sort of planning. He has already made pre-arrangements. Have you ever done that, made pre-arrangements? To try to prepare so things will run smoother? I was thinking about that, and, and, and Thomas was there. But let's pull, up, let's pull up that one map of Isle Royal, okay? Because here's, here's where I send men to, to be tortured. So, so in this picture, it's not the, the clearest, but this line right here is where the boat, see right here, the boat drops us off, and it drops us off in a little part called Rock Harbor. Now, the first year I took these guys, we were down here in um, Macargo Cove, right here in this area here, okay? And just so you guys can see over here, right there, we're about right there. We got to make our way. It's like the last campsite. We're heading back. I want them to see one of the prettiest campsites. So on, on Nile Royal, when you come into, it's just basically there's just a designated spots for you to put your tents and hammocks because they don't want to completely destroy vegetation, right? It's not like there's beautiful buildings or anything. But there's a lot of people on that island unless you travel really far. And, and we did do that. And, and we go off campsite because we get a special permit to do that. But when we we're coming back, you're coming back, other people are coming back, and people are just getting off the boat. And that's where it's bottleneck. Three mile is three miles from where the boat drops you off. The campsite I want 
is this beautiful place that's like a little neck and you come through between all these trees and over here is this rock cliff and then there's a little opening to put tents and stuff like that and hammocks and then another little bottleneck and then it opens up and there's this rock and the rock the rock is like the size of this platform and this is no joke you walk and then this is lake superior it's like you have your own private porch into lake superior and we we went swimming in there there was a little dip in the rock that water came in and heated up from the sun it was like a little hot tub and we'd lay in there and you know i wanted them to enjoy that and see that the problem is we can't get from here to here before everybody else gets there and claims the spot so i had to prepare in advance So I had a mission for one of our guys, and his name was Rogue. He's called Rogue because every time we turned around, he disappeared on us. You might know him as Bryce Rop. That's right. So we said, Bryce, we need you to get up in the middle of the dark, pack, draw those miles, claim that spot, and he was happy to do it. And we were happy to break down our stuff in the daylight. So it was a win-win. But all that had to take place because we were planning in advance. Now, I want to go back to this passage because this isn't an accident by Jesus. He has already planned in advance that this was going to take place. And I want you to see something because I think it's in verse 3. Can we go to verse 3 again? If anyone says anything to you, say the Lord needs them. Are you ready for this? And he specific he i'm almost wondering as if on a previous trip jesus had already planned this with an individual in fact he goes into such detail that he says if he asks any tw questions you tell him it's like a code word the lord needs him or needs them and that's what they say and all of a sudden here they come and jesus is placed on the donkey and here's what Matthew puts in here. He says this in verse uh, 5. Say to the daughter of Zion, your king comes to you gently, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, this, I, Jesus intentionally is coming into Jerusalem this way. If we go to, do we have Zechariah 9.9? 9? Let's read that for a second. This is a prophet, are you ready? This is a prophet who lived 500 years before. Uh, he was born in Babylon, but he was part of the, the captives that came back to Jerusalem, and God used him to prophesy for the people, hey, you might be back in Israel, but you need to come back to the Lord. And he would say this, he, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king will come to you, righteous, victoriously, lowly, riding on a donkey, the colt, the foal of a donkey. Every Jew was waiting for this on Passover that the king would come into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Now here comes Jesus, and what is he doing? Coming into the city, the same thing they're anticipating, it says, the king. So when, the, when he comes on a donkey, he is making a public declaration, I am the king. But it gets better. Because then, um, in, and just real quick, because we're going to run out of time here. Zechariah is filled with, with prophetic statements about the coming of Jesus, about the destruction of the temple, uh, about being betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, and about his coming again. But listen, I'm just going to read a couple of these passages real quick to you. Listen to this. In chapter 3, verse 8, it says, I'm going to bring my servant, and he will be the branch. Who's called the branch? Jesus. 
Chapter 6, verse 12. Here is the man. He is the branch. He will branch out and he will build the temple of the Lord. He will be clothed in majesty and he will rule and sit on the throne and he will also be a priest. Who is called the priest king? Jesus. 9, 16. The Lord will come and he will save them. What did Jesus do on the cross? He saved us. Chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace. They will look on me, the one they have pierced. And they will mourn as one mourns for an only child. Who was pierced for our transgressions? Jesus. 13, 7. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. What did they do when Jesus was arrested? They were scattered. Jesus not only was fulfilling this, showing them he was the king, he wanted them to see all the other prophecies that were within that exact same book. The king is coming. But then in 2 Kings chapter 9, verses 12 and 13, we're going to go to that in just a second. Here's something strange. Don't you, I mean, do people lay down coats for you to walk over? Do they cut branches and lay them down for you? To, don't you think that's strange? Elisha, a prophet from the Old Testament, in this story, he tells one of his younger assistants, hey, I need you to wrap your cloak and tuck it in because you are going to run to another city. How many here could run to another city? Exactly. Well, okay, Anthony could, but probably nobody else could. So, he tells him to go in the other city, and this is what's happening. He says, go, and you're going to anoint Jehu, who's a commander, and tell him he's going to be the king. You're going to anoint him, you're going to shut the door, and you're going to take back off so you don't get caught because you're going to be killed. Why? Because Ahab is the king, and his, his kingdom is done, and his wife is Jezebel. And you say, well, Lord, or Lord, how, how bad can these people be? Listen, listen to this. This is, this is from, I think, 1 Kings. It says, There never was a man like Ahab who sold himself to evil. He behaved in the most vilest manner, and his wife urged him on. That's how bad this is. And so he goes, and here is verses 12 and 13. This is what it says, because... The, the soldiers saw their commander go into the back room with this prophet who come running into town with his robe tucked in and did something and then tucked his robe and ran back out of town. They're like, what's going on? And he says, uh, he says something, and then he says, well, that's not true. They said, and they, oh, tell us. And Jehu says, okay, here's what he told me. This is what the Lord says. I anoint you king over Israel. So what did the soldiers do? They quickly took their cloaks. They spread them under him on the bare steps and they blew a trumpet and they shouted Jehu is king okay so when you place your cloaks below the individual you are announcing the king is here Jesus is on the donkey the king is coming the cloak is beneath him the king is here and then the people begin shouting Hosanna and if you think, oh, they're just, you know, they're just excited. He, he is coming here. It means more than save. It was a word that was used as redress from citizens to the king saying, because you are king, we need you to save us. That is your job and your duty. And now, Jesus is coming on the donkey, the cloaks are beneath them, and they are shouting, Hosanna. Now, put the three together. Jesus is declaring himself as king as he's riding in. The people place their cloaks on the ground, saying the king is here. And now, they are asking him for the king to save us now. Can you imagine the excitement that is going on in the city at that moment? It is hit high-pitched. I mean, they've been anticipating their whole life, generation after generation after generation. Some of them believe it's only a story. 
People are anticipating the Messiah. Every Passover they go, they talk about the Old Testament passage. Yeah, one day someone come riding on a donkey. That's what Grandpa said. And then all of a sudden, here comes Jesus, and people are screaming, and cloaks are being placed down. I mean, I think it's kind of hard sometimes for us to even fathom the excitement. Now, whatever video I was to show you, would pale in comparison. But for those who have been line fans for their whole life, you will get a small little feel for what excitement can look like. Let's watch this. You can smell it. Our team can smell it. It has been 30 years since the Lions won a division title. Lions blitz. Mullins is smacked. But is he in? Yes, sir. Mullins looking. Pressure comes. Stepping up. Looking. Throwing deep downfield. It is picked up by the Lions. Intercepted. Coming back the other way. Ifatu Malafonwu. This is going to be over. Lions are going to win it. The fourth interception of the day. Lions are bringing the NFC North title back to Detroit. So Detroit, what happens? The second you get your big party in your house, a ghost from the past comes creeping back right on time. It's just an average wild card game? No, it's not. This is special, but if you're golf, this is a game will be remembered, win or loss. The Lions are set to host an NFL playoff game. I don't think there's going to be a building maybe in the last five years yeah. that's going to be as loud as that Detroit building when that game starts. First home playoff game in 30 years. Go Lions! The building was humming, and I swear you could feel the electricity down the tunnel. Trying to get loud as you've ever been to here. 
Ford Field looks fantastic. We have never seen it look this good. Why? We've never seen the Lions with a home playoff game in this building more than two decades. Tonight, they've got a game. Won a division. Check that box. Got a home playoff game. Check that box. Tonight, they'll try to win a playoff game for the first time since 1991 and see if they can check that box as well. They come out here and leave no regret. Leave no regret. Jared leans in. There's the snap. Fakes the give. Nope, gave it to give. Straight up the gut. To the end zone. Touchdown, Detroit Lions. Oh, baby. Jared handing it off. Gibbs taking it home. And the Lions are up 14-3. It is fourth at about a yard and a half from the L.A. 2. Shotgun snap, Goff back, Goff looks, Goff pumps, now throws, end zone yes. caught, touchdown Detroit Lions, Sam Laporta. He's back, he's playing, and he's in the end zone. Matthew leans in, there's the snap, Stafford back, and looking, pressure comes, Stafford steps up, delivers downfield, it is knocked away, incomplete. And the Rams will send the punting unit out. The Lions are a first down away from locking this up. That was the moment where we need to seal this game, and we felt like the right thing to do was put it in his hands and get it to our best player. I was talking to Jared, and you know he told me the play call. Basically, he's coming to me, go win, and all the work that you put in, it basically comes down to, you know, that one play. Here we go. Golf works out of the gun. Second down and nine. Two minutes to go. There's Golf back, looking, looking, throws. It is caught on the Ross St. Brown. First down. Sutton gonna do it. Sutton gonna do it. Sutton gonna do it. Jared Golf delivers against his former team. Now all they have to do is take a knee three times, and this game will be over. That's game, right? For the first time since January 5th, 1992, these Detroit Lions are gonna win a playoff game. Oh Detroit, oh stand God. up! You waited for this! My goodness. Sheila Hand. Yes. Rod Wood. Yes. Mike Dister. Yes. Chris Spielman. Yes. Brad Holmes. Yes. Dan Campbell. Oh my God. They have brought it back to Detroit. <laughs> Put those arms in the air, 16. 65,000 strong standing. Best bands in the world. Yes, sir. Detroit for the first time in 32 years. Your Lions have won a playoff game. How about it? We can all, you know, relate to being doubted, being cast away, being told you're not good enough, and kind of always draw on that experience to, to push you in those hard times. We play next Sunday back here at home, guys. Yeah. the Jets, Jameer Gibbs running away from the defenders, and the Lions are back on top. Mayfield looks, throws the ball over the middle. Intercepted by the Lions, intercepted by the Lions. Derek Barnes, Derek Barnes, Derek Barnes. Oh, baby. What a night. What a night. Whether you're a football fan or not, if a city and a town and a state could get excited like that over 30 years of drought, what do you think it was like for a people for 700 years? 700 years of not being free. 700 years of being told, well, one day... He will come, the hope. Always thinking it was going to be in some other generation. And then on that day, you see a man on a donkey entering the city. And you see people laying their cloaks before him. And the crowd, absolutely exuberant, excited, shouting and screaming. And people are saying, what's going on? And then you hear, Hosanna. The king is here. And he has come to save us. Would you stand?
the city is ready to explode. It's electric. And as Jesus is entering, he is declaring, I am the priest king that you have been waiting for. And yet one week later, when they decide he's not the king they really wanted, they would turn from him. And I guess my question to us today is this. How quickly, when things don't go our way, or prayers are answered the way we want, do we turn like the crowd? Where just before, when everything was right, we're praising him and throwing up our arms in gratitude. You see, Jesus, he doesn't give you, you can't just make him who you want him to be. Will you take all of him? Because if you do, he has promised. He has promised that you would be victorious in this life. He promised that he would take you to be with him. They would help you to live the life you were meant to live. That you would accomplish the goals he's, he's wanting you to accomplish. When the good times are here, he is the king riding on a donkey. But may we continue to praise him, even, even when he's on a cross, even when we don't understand what's going to happen tomorrow, even when our plans don't go according to plan. Lord, this morning as we enter into this season, we, we, we cannot even really even fathom the electricity that it must have been like in Jerusalem as you came in. People weeping on their knees, crying, believing it was never going to happen. And then they saw you and they knew you were coming. But what they didn't know was you were coming as a lamb. But there will be a day you will come as a lion. But for now, would you help us? Help us to accept you as a lamb. And what that means to trust you even in the midst of confusion. The Messiah hope isn't putting Jesus in a box. It is putting him on the throne. Lord, we need you more than ever. We just cannot live this life apart from you. So this week, we pray, just slow it down. Help us to lean into the Spirit and what you're doing and what you're saying. And as we go into Good Friday, to really remember, you did that for us. Not because of what we've done, this week. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.